good term to use uh, in regards to that group. Um, so to pull up uh, slides here. All right, and I noticed some people in the chat are saying that we are muted, that they can't hear us. So oh, no. we're gonna work on that for a second. Sorry yeah. about that, everyone. Right. Um, we're having technical difficulties. Okay, so our sound should be good now. Can you hear us now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Oh, yay. Okay, Jackson and Ann said that we fixed it. Awesome. Thank you all. Sorry, that took us a minute. Um, so Christian, do you want to just recap why we're talking about yeah, sure sharks thing. as living fossils? Yeah, so uh, talking about sharks, um, that they are often called living fossils. Uh, they're thought to be particularly primitive or unevolved compared to other groups of fish or land vertebrates. Um, and indeed, you know, there are, there's a, a fo extensive fossil record of, uh, of various sharks, including like spectacular examples like Megalodon uh, going into deep time. Um, but it's actually quite a misconception to consider them particularly primitive. Um, now, why that idea may have come about in the first place uh, one is just because, you know, they're, they are a group very alien to what uh, sort of terrestrial mammals like ourselves, like our day-to-day -day lives living deep in the ocean. Um, but also because there is one major feature of sharks that uh, at first glance would seem to be quite, quite primitive, and that has to do with their skeleton. So if we look at a family tree of all the living vertebrates, this is all the animals with a backbone, although as you will uh, learn shortly, not all of them have bone in that backbone uh, in their spinal column. Um, the vast majority of living vertebrates fall into this group, uh, the bony fishes and the tetrapods, which are land vertebrates. So amphibians, reptiles, including birds and mammals. These are all the, the you know, living vertebrates that have bony skeletons. Um, sharks uh, fall outside of this group and quite famously lack bony skeletons. So if you look at a typical shark, like a spiny dogfish here, uh, its skeleton is comprised entirely out of cartilage. So cartilage is another connective tissue, much like bone, um, but is, is chemically and uh, histologically different from it. So in terms of its tissue structure, it's different. Uh, it's made up of mostly collagen uh, rather than minerals like uh, phosphate. Uh, and it's also completely lacks blood vessels or nerves, whereas bones have generally have blood vessels and nerves going through them. Um, so uh, most vertebrates have, including the bony vertebrates, have both bone and cartilage. So we have cartilage in a lot of our body, our noses and ears, for instance. The shape of them is determined by cartilage. Um, there's cartilage in between our joints, uh, like behind our kneecaps or in our elbow. Um, it is, it's a softer, more pliable tissue than bone, so it helps. So it's not just like bones grinding on bone uh, when we're moving around. Um, but in sharks, it is the entirety of the skeleton. And it also is the whole skeleton in this group that is even further down the tree. Um, and often described as sort of the most primitive vertebrates, the agnathans. Um, they are primitive in the sense that they, agnatha means no jaw. And so these are the jawless fish. Um, if you look at the two living agnathan groups, lampreys and hagfish, uh, they don't have mobile jaws. They just kind of have these holes in the face that are their mouth that are covered in these little uh, sort of hook-like, um, they're not true teeth. Uh, they're just sort of made of the same stuff as horn uh, for rasping, uh, latching on to prey in the lamprey's case and tearing apart uh, carcasses while they scavenge in the hagfish's case. So these animals, they don't have jaws. Um, they are themselves highly specialized though. So there's nothing else really that has this almost sort of like leech-like appearance like lampreys. Um, so it, in a way it's wrong to think of them as purely primitive, but they, they do lack jaws. And they also do lack a bony skeleton. So if you look, this is a cleared and stained larva of a lamprey. You can see that, that uh, what we would call the backbone, the spinal column is there, uh, but it's, it's made out of cartilage. So it 
doesn't have any bone. Um, and so if you only had these modern examples to look at sharks and jawless fish, uh, you could pretty safely conclude that bone evolved only once in vertebrate history in the common ancestor of all the bony fishes and the land vertebrates. Um, and that all of the things outside of that, you know, only had cartilage and that sort of a cartilaginous skeleton is ancestral for vertebrates. Um, however, we, you know, thankfully, we don't just have living animals uh, to consider uh, when studying evolution. We have everything from the fossil record. And when you expand this family tree into all the fossil fish groups, uh, you actually see a very different story. Um, so here are those uh, vertebrates that have jaws, which is a group called nathostomes. Um, so this is cartilaginous fish in the sense of sharks, rays, and skates, and then all the bony fish. Uh, and then also this extinct group, placoderms, that we'll be talking about shortly. Um, but then among the jawless fish, it's not just lampreys and hagfish. There's this huge diversity of extinct jawless forms. Um, which came in all sorts of shapes and sizes, um, really extensive uh, morphological and species diversity in these extinct jawless fish from the Paleozoic era, um, which had their greatest diversity um, between around 450 and 350 million years ago, which is spanning the Ordovician through the Devonian. And so these extinct jawless fish are collectively called the astracoderms, um, even though they're, it's not a natural group, it's just sort of an informal term for all of these bony jawless fish. So you can see uh, in this drawing here, it looks like it's covered in, almost in a shell or in a shield around the head and has these sort of like plates on the rest of the tail. And these are made of bone. So these were jawless fish that had uh, bony exoskeletons almost, um, and that which makes them fossilize actually very well. So the fossil record, especially in the Devonian, is full of these uh, bony jawless fish, particularly their head shields. Um, so animals like shown in this, uh, this picture here, these are fossils of an astracoderm named Drepanaspis and another one called Teraspis. Um, you can see these animals are actually quite strange in their appearance. Uh, some of them look a lot like alien spaceships. There are entire groups that are exceedingly bizarre of these astracoderms, such as the galeaspids, uh, which are mostly known from the Silurian uh, of uh, East Asia. Um, these include some of the friendliest of all the jawless fishes. Um, but there's a lot of strangeness and diversity uh, in the agnathans. Um, and they did, have, uh, they did have bone. So it's not just that uh, bone is present in what we call the bony fish, osteichthyes. Uh, it evolved fairly early uh, in vertebrate evolution. Um, and it's also present in this group, the placoderms, which is outside even of sharks. Um, so these are, this is a group that also has like these bony head shields, uh, but do have true jaws. And so the most famous uh, member of this group is probably this animal, Dunkelosteus, uh, which we've talked about on this program before. Um, really spectacular animal, up to 30 feet long, very large predator in the Devonian. Um, and you can see in the skull there, so it does have this head shield, um, but it also has a, a lower jaw, but it's made up of a single sort of like blade of bone uh, that it probably would have been using for cracking open the shields of other smaller fishes in its habitat. Um, and you can see also in this animal that even the eyeball is covered in bone. So this is, you know, this is definitely a, a, a bone having animal, even though it's not what we would call the group bony fishes, osteichthyes. Um, um, so You know, they are a better uh, ancestral condition for fishes, uh, for modern fishes, than sharks are. So sharks, you know, traditionally held up as these exemplars of primitiveness among fishes. Um, probably not the case. So one is just that uh, placoderms don't seem to be sort of a single group. Uh, rather, they seem to be this grade, which means that they're a series of lineages intermediate between the jawless fishes and the, the later jawed fishes, the living fishes. 
So you have this whole diversity of placoderms. They're sort of like stepwise uh, moving towards a sort of the, the bony fish and shark condition. And this is shown really well in this animal that was discovered just a few years ago. This is a placoderm called Entelignathus uh, that unlike other placoderms has complex jaws. So you'll remember in Dunkelosteus that just has that one sort of like blade of bone as the lower jaw. But Entelignathus has sort of the full complement of later vertebrate jaw bones, uh, namely the premaxilla, the maxilla, and the denary bone. Uh, separated out as individual ossifications. Um, and interestingly, this is what you see in bony fishes, but not in sharks, which just have these simple jaw cartilages. So it suggests that the, the bony fish jaw actually predates the origin of sharks and true bony fishes, and that then these jaw elements would have had to have been lost in the shark lineage. Um, so this was a very intriguing discovery and the latest discovery, which is just from this month, uh, puts an even further twist on this idea that sharks are actually quite specialized. Um, this is an animal called Mingenia. Uh, this is a, a placoderm described from three-dimensional material from the early Devonian of Western Mongolia. And the, the fossil itself may not look particularly impressive, um, but the, the bone quality is very good. And the, the researchers working on this um, were able to throw it into a, you know, a CT scanner and look at the histology, sort of the fine tissue structure of this bone in great detail. And what they found to their shock is that it contains a type of bone called endochondral bone. Um, so there are two major types of bone um, and they're different between these jawless fish and then later bony fishes. So there's bone called dermal bone, which just means skin bone. Um, it's not necessarily bone that's in your skin, but it's bone that forms from the mesoderm. So when an embryo is developing, there are different sort of tissue layers that produce different parts of the body. And the dermal bone forms uh, in between sort of membranes of this tissue. And it forms, it's just precipitated directly uh, into, into the flesh, basically, um, as these thin sheets. And so we have dermal bones ourselves. We retain some. Basically, most of the bones of the skull are dermal bone in later vertebrates. But the entirety of the skeleton is dermal bone, the exoskeleton of these jawless fish. And it was thought that the same was true for placoderms. Um, and most of the skull in placoderms is, is dermal bone, uh, but here is, is some bone that's endochondral in origin. So what does that mean? So endochondral bone is bone that is first formed by a sort of a prototype of cartilage. And in land vertebrates like ourselves, uh, it's most of the skeleton. So our ribs, our vertebrae, our limbs, they all form uh, basically so while in the embryonic phase, this is, as in just one example, a limb bone, um, it will form from this elongate sort of like dumbbell-shaped proto-bone out of cartilage. Uh, the cartilage is then uh, deteriorated and bone tissue starts forming to replace it over time through what's called ossification, um, eventually uh, forming a, you know, the complete bones that we have as adults. Um, so be, starting with cartilage and then replacing that to form bone uh, was thought to be a unique feature of osteichthyes. However, if it's present ancestrally in placoderms, as this new specimen Mingenia indicates, uh, it shows that like our ideas on the origins of endochondral bone are actually quite wrong. Um, and instead, what seems to be happening is that uh, dermal bone uh, appears very early in vertebrate evolution in some of these, these earliest jawless fishes uh, going back maybe almost 500 million years. And then endochondral bone uh, originates at the base of the, the nathostomes in this group, the placoderms, uh, meaning that sharks are actually super specialized. They're not primitive at all in their skeletons or in lacking bone, that this, they have lost both dermal and endochondral bone. Um, and instead have this, you know, unique and highly specialized, fully cartilaginous skeleton 
that they evolved uh, independently of the rest of these groups. So it's not a primitive retention of what is present in like lampreys or hagfish. Um, it's a unique specialization of sharks within the nathostomes. And I think that's a, that's a really cool result. Yeah, that is really cool. And so what you're saying is that, you know, we often think of sharks as living fossils because it's like, oh, they haven't changed in millions of years, but that that's completely false. And that this report yeah. helps show that. Yes. So, you know, there, there are, there are individual shark species, which are, you know, a few million years old. Like if you look at the Cenozoic record, uh, you can find teeth from tiger sharks and, uh, you know, dogfish and things going back 10, 20 million years. But this idea that like sharks as a group are like unchanged for hundreds of millions of years is, is totally false. Uh, one, they, they have, as the group as a whole, uh, changed a lot compared to just the ancestral condition in fishes, which was more like these bony placoderms. Um, and then even in individual species, there has been a lot of change. Uh, even in sort of recent years, um, in the sense that, like, you know, we don't have things like megalodon around anymore. So there's, we've shifted just in the past 10 million years or less. Uh, we've seen the evolution of things like the modern great white shark from extinct types of mako. So, you know, everything, it is, it is always changing. Uh, some groups do have higher evolutionary rates than others, but like nothing is like truly unevolved or purely primitive. They're all selected to, to meet the needs of their environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so sharks have a cartilaginous skeleton mm -hmm. and I always think of cartilage. Well, it's just like you said, it's squishy, right? It's it, because it doesn't contain the hard minerals. So I'm just imagining a shark being like entirely squishy on the inside and it doesn't seem useful so but there's a reason that they lost you know any form of of bone so what are the advantages to having a cartilaginous skeleton sure um well first i should note that not all cartilage is like is squishy it may be more pliable than bone um but in some of the very large sharks actually like uh, whale sharks and great whites they have what's called prismatic calcified cartilage um, which is basically they do mineralize it to an extent with just uh, calcium supporting it. Um, so it's not, it's not ossified, it's not true bone, but it does have minerals uh, to strengthen the cartilage. Um, so we get uh, around here, for example, we occasionally will find vertebral discs from big extent sharks. And the reason that that fossilizes, whereas most shark skeletons don't fossilize, is because it does have that calcium in there. Um, but that's pretty rare uh, for the most part, like most living sharks don't have highly mineralized skeletons. It is quite squishy. Um, and why would that be an advantage over these? Uh, you know, it seems like having the bone shield seems great because it, it protects you against all but like the largest and scariest of predators like Dunkelosteus. Um, yeah, they got, like, got a helmet head going on and some of yeah. them have a spike. That's cool. Yeah, they basically have their own suit of armor that they're moving around at all times. Um, however, uh, you know, a suit of armor is very heavy and makes it very difficult to move and be maneuverable. And one thing about a lot of these early, uh, the jawless fishes that, are, that are, have the bone shields, these astracoderms, um, it's thought that they were spending a lot of time on the ocean bottom or on like river bottoms. Um, and they were living in the benthos, sort of on the, the substrate uh, and either feeding on detritus or like little, you know, shrimp or mollusks and worms living in the muck. Um, they weren't very active swimmers. They weren't necessarily up in the water column. Um, and the ocean's a big place and there's a lot of different niches to occupy sort of within different depths of the sea. Um, and it can be very, like if you're totally covered in armor, it, it's not super helpful to be, uh, you know, up at the the surface of the water, for instance. Um, and so uh, modern bony fishes are able to get around that because they have what's called the swim bladder, which is a, a gas filled, almost like kind of a balloon like structure inside of their body, um, which allows them to maintain neutral buoyancy. So uh, 
you know, if you've ever like exhaled uh, while swimming in a pool or in the ocean or something and sunk down, um, and you can, you probably know how difficult it is to maintain forward momentum. Like it takes, a, swimming takes a lot of work. And if you're swimming all the time like a fish, uh, you don't want to constantly be fighting against gravity of sinking down into the ocean. So neutral buoyancy is good. The swim bladder just like keeps them at the same position in the water column and requires relatively little effort for them to either swim a little bit higher or a little bit lower, um, but they're not constantly fighting against sinking. Um, sharks, however, do not have a swim bladder. So that is, that's a feature unique to the bony fishes. Um, so if they want to occupy uh, high, basically any part of the ocean other than just like down on the bottom, um, they would have to swim for it if they had armor um, and expend a lot of energy. So by totally ditching the skeleton, they've lightened up their bodies considerably. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for them to maintain buoyancy and also just to keep on swimming. So it's a lot easier to swim, you know, without a suit of armor on you than otherwise. Uh, and it probably a lot of the early success in the shark lineage, because they are some of the most early on, like in the Carboniferous and the late Devonian sharks are uh, early sharks and some of their relatives, the chimeroids, um, which are similar to the modern ratfish. Uh, are hugely diverse, and they have this this massive burst of adaptation and diversification, um, which may have been related to sort of like losing this bony shield in favor of a cartilaginous skeleton. And is it true that sharks have to swim forward constantly, like in order to breathe? I think for their gills to, you know, be used properly. Uh, it's so you will sometimes hear that if a shark stops swimming, it will suffocate. That is not true. Uh, so there are, you know, there are sharks like sleeper sharks and a lot of the rays and skates that will just like hang out on the bottom of the ocean and do what's called spiracular breathing. So they can still pump through their spiracles into the gills. Um, but with that said, a lot of the oceanic sharks basically, you know, are moving constantly. Like they don't really sleep. Uh, they will go in, they will have times of inact relative inactivity, um, but they are swimming, you know, basically all the time um, in order to, to stay up in, in the water column, among other things. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'm not seeing any questions from our viewers right now. Um, remember, y'all, you can type into the chat um, if you have any questions about this discovery, but I think we're gonna turn it over to um, look at some of the questions that some of our new subscribers have submitted to us through our um, Ask a Naturalist form, which I'll put into the chat. So man, they have some awesome questions. Let's see. All right, let's get down to it. Yeah. And these are more, you know, general paleontology questions. Mm -hmm. We can answer it in, in any program at the end of any old news episode. All right. Are there any good mnemonics to remember the eras of time? Yes. Uh, I mean, generally, like I have, uh, it's become so ingrained in me uh, that, you know, I don't really use a mnemonic. Um, but yeah, there are some out there. Like, uh, here's, here's one. Um, Camels often sit down carefully. Perhaps their joints creak. Persistent early oiling might prevent permanent rheumatism. <laughs> um, I feel like I need a mnemonic device for that mnemonic device. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the problem, the problem with mnemonics for the geological periods is that there's a lot of them. Um, so going through all of especially the, like the Paleozoic has a lot of periods in it. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's better. Like I like to, you know, think of it in terms of, of the geological time scale and like, oh, what's on the bottom, what's on the top of the strata rather than trying to, to remember a particular mnemonic. Like if you remember, okay, it starts with the Cambrian, it ends with sort of the, the Holocene and then fill it out in between. Or you can like subdivide it like, okay, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, very easy to remember, just the three eras, and then break it down into the component parts. So, mm -hmm. Some easier than others. Like Mesozoic is easy because it just has three periods, Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. 
all the Paleozoic periods and all of the Cenozoic epochs uh, can be more confusing. Right. Do you by any chance have a picture of um, the geologic time scale just like with yeah, presentation just pull, or even? Just, I sure do. Let me just pull that back just, up. Just for fun on your on your computer there so that we can show people what we're talking about. Yeah, so it's just, a good reference. Just looking at the, uh, I mean, we're mostly interested in the periods of the Phanerozoic because that's when most fossils are found. That's when all the basically com all complex life, so multicellular life, is found in the the Phanerozoic. Um, the only animals from the Precambrian are from the very end of it and are kind of like small worm-like or jellyfish-like things. Um, of course, like the vast majority of Earth's history is is Precambrian, uh, the the billions of years preceding the Phanerozoic. Uh, but also, even, it's even like in the name that we don't care about it because it's just called Precambrian. Cambrian <laughs> is when things start to get good. Is when we start to get critters, um, and then throughout the rest of the Phanerozoic, uh, you have all of basically all of the the well known prehistoric animals. Mm -hmm. In terms of the paleontology, things before then are are pretty boring, unless you're super into uh, evidence of fossilized bacteria, which admittedly, you know, there's a lot of cool uh, work to be determined there down to the origin of life itself. Um, but, you know, in terms of impressive fossils, not really going to get those in the Precambrian. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, Anne has a great question about this month's discovery. Uh huh. Could those Western Mongolian fossil fish be juveniles and not ossified yet? So the the evidence for endochondral bone um, isn't really for, uh, that it was necessarily like like it's that it's super spongy. It has to do with the um, the histological structure of it. It has this characteristic branching structure what's called trabecular structure that you only see in endochondral bone rather than uh, dermal bone. So the dermal skeleton of that animal actually seems to be quite heavily ossified. So it's what we would expect in an adult of one of these fishes. Um, there are juveniles known for a lot of the astracoderms because their fossil record's so good. There are like little teraspis and hemicyclaspis type things. Um, and so something is known of like the ossification sequence uh, of the dermal bones. Um, but no, for Mangini, I don't think uh, you can uh, assign this, this new bone type to, uh, to how it was growing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really nifty that they can, you know, do the, the bone histology to actually, yeah, tell the differences in, in, in those types of bone. Um, I always like seeing pictures of uh, bone histology like mm -hmm. of the bone underneath a microscope. I just, I don't know. I feel like they could be artwork, you know, hung on my walls. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I think especially through different polarized filters, uh, there's some very beautiful bone sections out there. Yeah. All right, so coming soon, everyone, um, our Etsy, where we're just gonna show <laughs> all the uh, art artistic bone histology samples. <laughs> um, okay, another question. Um, about general paleontology, Cody wants to know, is there any paleontologi paleontological work going on in Antarctica? Yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, at this very moment, I don't think so, because it's coming off the end of their winter when it's basically no-go zone uh, on a lot of the continent. Um, and, you know, who's to say, like, how the polar programs will proceed uh, with the pandemic and everything? But uh, in the past few years, there has been extensive work uh, in the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, all the parts of the Mesozoic uh, in Antarctica. Um, so the Cretaceous is mostly known from a small islands off the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, like Vega Island. Um, they're marine habitat, so you get things like mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, uh, seabirds, you know, some of these big marine reptiles from there. Uh, ammonites, other uh, sea invertebrates from there. Mm -hmm. um, the Triassic and the Jurassic are known from the central Transantarctic Mountains, which is one of the, some of the most formidable uh, areas on Earth in terms of human survival there. 
uh, but their uh, work has been done since the 1960s, uh, pulling out wonderful specimens of proto mammals like dicynodonts and cynodonts, the things that you know I work on most um, in the Triassic, and then uh, dinosaurs in the Jurassic. So there are these animals like Cryolophosaurus, which is a big predator, uh, kind of, you can think of it somewhat like Allosaurus or Ceratosaurus. And then this animal called Glacialosaurus, which is a uh, long-necked herbivore, one of these early sauropodomorphs. Um, so yeah, definitely lots of fossils from Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of diversity. And you mentioned Mosasaur. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of our uh, subscribers, they said that their favorite prehistoric animal was a Mosasaur. So. Nice. Yeah, it's a good love one. Love to hear that. Yeah, and we actually, um, in Old News Episode 8, Penguins of the Past and Present, we talked about some research from Antarctica. So I'll throw the link to that episode in the chat. And let's move on to our next question. Jackson wants to know, what is the ancestor of all bony fish? So it seems like it, it would have looked something very similar to Antelognathus or Minginia. Um, so if we pull uh, Antelognathus up again, Yeah, so it would have still had uh, part of this exoskeleton going on, um, but it would have started to have endochondral bone. It would have had these complex jaws. Um, it seems uh, there's also uh, historically like lobe fin fish, the sarcopterygians, were considered like somehow more derived or more specialized than other bony fish because they are the group that includes tetrapods. And like, as humans, we're very self-centered and we always think, okay, if it's more closely related to us, it has to be more specialized. Um, the other, you know, the other group of fish, the, the actinopterygians, uh, that includes, you know, most, most of your, the fish you can think of, like, you know, goldfish, salmon, carp, stuff like that. Um, but it turns out they also are actually quite, quite specialized. It's the sarcopterygians that have the somewhat more primitive morphology. Uh, and the earliest, um, you know, actinopterygians actually look more like early sarcopterygians. So yeah, something intermediate between sort of like derived placoderms like Antelognathus and the earliest sarcopterygians would be the common ancestor of all, all the bony fishes. That was a great question, Jackson. Um, all right, so I'm not seeing any more questions in our live chat, but I have another great question from one of our new subscribers. Okay. What was the biggest fossil insect ever found? So it, it depends on how you measure it, uh, but the, the biggest wingspan of any fossil insect is this animal called Meganeuropsis permiana, which was found in Elmo, Kansas. Um, in rocks from the early Permian. Uh, so these are things, you know, 270 odd million years ago. And it was a giant dragonfly. And so dragonfly with roughly, you know, maybe two foot or more wingspan uh, and probably would have been quite a terrifying predator to the, the little bugs and little sort of like lizard-like like reptiles and amphibians of the time. That is awesome. I, you know, I don't think I would mind having a huge dragonfly flying around. I think that that would be kind of cool. I mean, it would just be like some of our larger birds, I guess. Yeah, like they, they wouldn't hurt us. I mean, we're big enough that we're not potential prey for a, even for a two foot long dragonfly. Yeah, um, that's true. And dragonflies don't have like venom or anything, so we don't need to worry about it. Uh, like even compared to a spider or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but you know, one of the one of the things I think we appreciate dragonflies a lot for in our current environment is their uh, efficacy in mosquito control. And dragonfly that size probably would be eating like you know sparrows and other small birds rather than than mosquitoes. So seeing you know like a little 
a pigeon outside your window just explode into feathers as a two foot dragonfly uh, crashes down on it uh, might still be somewhat distressing. Um. Yeah, I don't want to imagine that, <laughs> but I love that you're looking at the bigger picture of, you know, not just would we like this creature, but, you know, what uh, what would be its role in the ecosystem and how yeah. would that change? That's, that's so fun. Um, oh, Jackson got bingo, three bingos. Nice. I'll tell y'all how to play bingo um, at the end of the program. Before we wrap things up, we're gonna answer one more question from Cody. And that is, would the Megalodon have had a cartilage skeleton or a bony skeleton? Oh, so yeah, good question. So as, as a shark, Megalodon definitely had a cartilaginous skeleton. And indeed this is, that's most of the reason why we don't have any complete skeletons of Megalodon. We actually, we only have the teeth of Megalodon um, and maybe some of these, these big isolated vertebral discs, but even those have not been found sort of like in articulation with jaws. Um, jaw cartilages are known for some, fossilized jaw cartilages are known for some fossil sharks, but there's not like a whole set of jaws known for Megalodon, although there are some associated sets of teeth that we can infer were from a single individual. So yeah, uh, if, you know, if Megalon had a bony skeleton, you know, we probably would have a nice, nice complete one by now, but alas, is not to be, uh, and may, may well never be found. Right. Just keep hunting for those, you know, massive teeth because those are super cool anyway. <laughs> yep. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Christian, of course, as usual, thank you for sharing your expertise with oh, us. My, my pleasure. And um, that's all the time we have for questions today. But, you know, we're going to have the Ask a Paleontologist form. You can submit questions at any time and we'll answer them live at the end of every, um, every explanation of the discovery during each old news episode. So mark your calendars for October 29th where uh, we'll be discussing October's new discovery. And you can sign up for our mailing list. And I'm gonna throw a link into the chat. Um, so it's free, you just sign up and I'll send you reminders, updates, um, fun additional activities like old news bingo, which you can play um, you know, as you watch the episode. And you also get a little sneak peek at what the topic is going to be because Christian and I don't know what the topic is going to be. Christian picks it pretty much like the day before we do this live. <laughs> so you get a sneak peek if you get the reminder. So, you know, sign up for that if you, if you want to. And um, yeah, we hope you all have a great day and thank you again for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.